Hello everyone, welcome back to another video talking about the introduction to the finite element method in which we are going to cover a book called A First Course in the Finite Element Method by Daryl Logan and in this video we are actually talking about chapter 3 which deals with the analysis of trusses and in this video we're going to take a look on a broader example about trusses this is something i quickly added into the video series because i think it makes sense to solve a truss and compare it with structural analysis softwares like autodesk robot with that being said let's dive deep into it so sit back relax and enjoy the show Alright, so the truss in question is basically shown in the figure here. Um, you have like small loads of 400 Newton and 1200 Newtons. This truss is taken from a book called Structural Analysis from R.C. Hibbler. It's a very known uh, structural analysis book and this truss is taken from it. Although I take note of the forces, but our point today is to have a bigger truss that you can face in real life. And I chose this from Hibbler. Of course, the loads need to be more modified, but Today, I'm not about the loads. Now, of course, the, the members are steel and the members have an area of 0 0.05 meters square. And with that being said, let's dive into it. So the first thing that you should start doing is basically to find the local and global transform stiffness matrices. Now, please notice that this is a continuation of a longer video series, which I will be linking on the top right right now here. And if you somehow missed uh, the video series, you should take a look at it first then continue this video. At least you should also take a look on the principles of truss elements and those are lectures I will link once again above on the right side, top right, just in case you missed it. We all know that a local stiffness matrix for a truss element is A, E over L multiplied by 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. This is of course a compact way of calculating the stiffness matrix and we need to expand it because we need to multiply it by a transformation matrix. We expand it by adding zeros in places where I don't need them. So just to remind you, if this is a truss element, then you have node number one, for example, and node number two. Both nodes can move in the local U axis. I will call this U2. And in the local U axis here, I will call this U1. Of course, this is local now. And it also could move in the local Y axis or V axis. Now, you know, U is in the X axis and V is in the Y axis. I'll call this V2. And it can also move here in the local y-axis, I'll call it v1. And there are also forces corresponding to those movements. Please notice that for a truss element, the real movement that actually plays a role in forces are the local uh, u-movements in the direction of the truss, because those are the things that increase or decrease the length, and that's the reason why you see numbers there, and you see zeros everywhere else, because the y-axis, the local y-axis of a truss element, plays no role, and we can ignore it. In case you're wondering why we are basically expanding this matrix, we're expanding this because we need to um, invert it, and if you have missed it somehow, I would highly recommend you check out the videos I referenced before. Now, this is the transformation matrix. It has, of course, the shape of cosine sine 0, 0, negative sine cosine 0, 0, 0, 0 cosine sine, and 0, 0 negative sine cosine, with cosine being meant the direction of the element, cosine of the direction, and sine being S, which is the sine of the direction of the element, which would give you this matrix. Now, once you have your local stiffness matrix in the expanded form, the K matrix, and you have your transformation matrix, you can find the global element matrix by multiplying T transpose, multiplied by local stiffness, multiplied by the transformation matrix T again. Now with those principles out of the way, let's take a look on the elements. Now I need to do every single element in this truss and you bet we're going to make every one of them. So we start with element AG. Uh, now I know you should have numbers for the nodes, but I will keep the letters and send letters here. This is element AG, so from A to G, which means that it moves like this from A to G, that's its local x-axis. You would think, why doesn't he take from G to A? I've proven to you that if you take from A to G or G to A, it's going to be the same. It ends up to be the same matrix. So, of course, you need to find the local stiffness matrix, which is basically AE over L, which you can see here. In the expanded form, it looks like this. Notice this is local. And why are we doing this? We are doing this because you want to find F capital, which is the global forces, equals K capital, which is the global stiffness matrix, 
multiply it by, some people call it x, some people call it d or u. I just say it u for now or something or d, which is the global displacement matrix. And we need to find the global stiffness matrix. And it starts all here. You find your local element matrix, you find your transformation matrix, which is CS, negative SC. You multiply T transpose, multiplied by K local, multiplied by T, which gives you the K small, which is the global stiffness matrix for the element in the following matrix. Of course, please notice that I actually did this in MATLAB. It's a little bit more than this. I mean, you see here only three numbers because I have limited screen space, but in reality, you should take at least four numbers to be accurate. But I just have everything in MATLAB, so I get the correct answers because MATLAB has at least 15 digits accuracy. Okay, so this is the stiffness matrix of AG. If you go to the next one, which is GE, which means this is your element from G to E, it's theta is zero because it's horizontal, which means its cosine is zero, one, and its sine is zero. You find its local stiffness matrix, you find its expanded local stiffness matrix, and by the way, the expanded local stiffness matrix is the same as the global stiffness matrix. Why? because the local x-axis of the element coincides with the global x-axis of the structure, so there is no transformation needed. You can see this by seeing that the transformation matrix is the identity matrix, which means it doesn't change anything in the stiffness matrix. So when you calculate T transpose KT, you get the very same matrix. So this is easy. Now notice also that, and I will mention this, that the stiffness matrix of GE is the same as AB, BC, and CD. But why is that? It's the same numerically. Numerically, it's the same. Because the area of the element is the same, the elastic modulus of the element is the same, and the length of the element is the same. Also, the transformation matrix of those elements are the same. All those elements are horizontal, all those elements are four meters long, all those elements have the same area, elastic modulus, so this means that the stiffness matrices of all those elements are the same. We go on and see stiffness element ED, which is basically this element from E to D. Now, its theta is negative theta here. I mean, you have to calculate the theta. For example, let's say that the theta here is 35 degrees, for example. Notice that here you need to pay attention to your cosines and sines because the cosine is positive because, I mean, look, from E to D, you are going in the positive x-axis sense, and the sine is negative because you're going down in the y-axis sense, or you can just find it from the cosines and sines of your theta. You're gonna have a negative sign because of mathematics, and it's important to mention this because I've seen a lot of people messing this up exactly. Same steps apply. Now, this is really an invitation to you to try do this at yourself at home. Now, for this, you need to have MATLAB, access to MATLAB, or to Octave, which eases the calculation of matrices for you because hand calculating that thing is not really that possible. Now, we basically going to expand the local stiffness matrix, you know that well, expand this local stiffness matrix, calculate the transformation matrix, and calculate the global stiffness matrix. Now notice that the stiffness matrix of ED and the stiffness matrix of GC are going to be the same, because they have the same length and the same orientation. One could think, wait a minute, AG should be the same as GC, because I mean, it has the same length, right? Well, no, because AG has a different theta than ED. I know that both theta are numerically the same, but in actuality, one of them is negative because it's clockwise measured from x-axis, and one of them is positive, which is counterclockwise measured from x-axis. You can see the effect of the difference here at the cosines and sines. Here you have cosine positive, sine negative. In AG, you had both cosine and sine positive, and that subtle difference is what makes a difference in the stiffness matrix. So going on, we go to BG. BG is this column standing up. I can just here quickly say that BG and CE have the same stiffness matrix. BG, notice it's gonna be vertical up, so its cosine is zero and its sine is one, which means you know the drill. You calculate local stiffness matrix, you expand, you find transformation, and you find global stiffness matrix. If you think this is tedious, you have seen nothing, my friend. You can see me just getting, uh, saying what I said before, that there are some similarities in some of those elements. If you think this is tedious, oh boy, you have seen nothing yet. Because now, my dear viewer, now is where the fun starts. And this is where you definitely need to program your own subroutine. And uh, believe me, you, uh, I have programmed everything in C Sharp and in MATLAB. And, you know, in the beginning, it's really tedious to program all this. 
but you feel like a king when you do that. Maybe, maybe, maybe in the far away future, but this is something that I don't think my viewership is interested in. Maybe in the future, I would have a series where I discuss programming the finite element method. Now, this is not really appealing, I think, to my viewership. Uh, it's not a core thing that they want to know, but uh, maybe I will add this in the very far away future for now. I don't think so. This is extremely important for people who want to continue their master or PhD and also who are like me and want to make their own structural analysis softwares like Strato. Let's focus on the issue here. Okay, so now let's, let's take a look. Now this is, we start filling our global matrix. Our global matrix here, you have UA and you have VA and you can see me putting different circles with different colors to denote where, the, where those numbers come from. Suppose you want the column UA with the row UA, you have to look at the elements that list the, the, the letter A in them. And you can see this lists the letter A in it, and this lists the letter A in it. Now A with A, or UA with UA, is the orange thing that you can see be here being highlighted. And the summation of those, of course, gives you this. What about um, column VA? with row UA, I'm talking about the blue one now, the column VA with row UA, you can see the same thing happening here. I have highlighted for you the blue circles, 0.96 and zero, so that you can basically understand what the value here is. Now, of course, I don't really recommend it, but I might suggest that you should try fill it out yourself here, and then come back and take a look if it's right or wrong. Finally, you have VA with VA, that's the red line, that's the red circle, and you can see me circling in red all the things that are related to that thing. We go on and we start with B, which is gonna be a long story, by the way. I will only discuss this a little bit in detail for some pieces. Look, it's always, it's always important to ask yourself, what is the name of my column, if I want to talk about the orange now, and what is the name of my row? So the orange place here has a column of UB and a row of UA. So we have to look where are the elements that list A and B as their values. We need to look at the elements that list A and B as their nodes. And the only element that lists A and B as their node is this. You can also see it from the structure itself. The only element that connects A with B is this element. So you are basically predicting that you're gonna only see one element and that's the case. You see me circling here. Uh, because the element is called AB, which means that the first block is for A and the second block is for B in both directions. You want the column UB with the row UA, which means your orange one here is the case. It's very important that you try this at home one time so that you appreciate the construction of the stiffness matrix. VB with UA, uh, UB with uh, VA, and VB with VA. They're all zeros as per what you can see here. We go on with UC, VC, and UA, VA. You can see that this connects the node C with node A. If you take a look on the structure, a and C are in no way, shape, or form connected by a single element. This element that connects them is two elements, so they don't see each other directly, which means you see zeros. Similarly, A and D don't see each other. The block of D and the block of A doesn't see each other because they are miles away. I mean, I can predict now that, of course, A and E will not see each other, but A and G will see each other, so let's take a look. A and E indeed are zeros, and A and G have values. So we are now connecting the block, the G block in the column with the A block in the row. And well, basically the only element that has two things listed is this element. And you can see me taking the corresponding values. This is the column UG with the row UA. This is the column VG with the row VA. And you can see me filling the values just fine. Did you finish? No, you wish, because you continue now. Now we are with the block B. I call it the block B because it contains UB and VB. With the block B. So we're talking about B with itself. Now B with itself means that you are seeing three elements. Because there are three elements who have B with itself. You have AB you have BC and you have BG. So from the get-go, you're expecting three elements to contribute to that thing. And that's indeed the case. You can see here, that's BG and it contributes. You can see BC, which contributes. And you can see AB, which contributes. Notice, sometimes the elements are on the top left, sometimes the elements are on the bottom right. You don't know because it depends on how you name your elements. If you name it AB, this means that the later part is your B. If you name it BG, this means that the former, the first part is B. 
You have to pay attention to this because it will change your answers if you don't do it right. We go to UCUB. Well, before I go, let me let me do a prediction. We are saying now we are going to go to UC or point C with point B. Now, point C with point B is only connected by one element, so I'm expecting the next slide to have only BC here. So let's take a look. Indeed it is. We are connecting C with B, and the only element that does that is this here. You can see me putting the values just fine. The next slide is going to have D with B. There is no connection between D with B, so there will be zeros. The one after it is going to have E with B. There is no connection between E with B, so there are zeros. And the one after it is going to have G with B. There is only one element connecting G with B, so I'm expecting after three slides, this to be highlighted. So let's take a look. D with B, indeed zeros. E with B, indeed are zeros. And G with B, you can see the element exactly as I expected being highlighted. And this gets on and on and on and on. So I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit to save time for the dear viewer because now I'm just rinsing and repeating. So you continue here. This is C with C. C with C, you notice, has four elements, so you can see four places being highlighted. You go D with C. D with C is only in one element, so you can see one element being highlighted. E with C, you can see one element, so it's one element being highlighted. C with G is basically also one element, so you can see this element being highlighted. And that's it. Now you go to D. D with D has two elements. D with D has two elements because it connects itself by two elements. So you see two elements being highlighted. D with E has... Oh, I think I jumped it over. D with E has only one element. I'm talking about this. So we go to the element that has DE. Now it's called ED. So this here is the block of E. And this here is the block of D. Similarly, this here is the block of E, and this here is the block of D. You want D, you want here column E with row D, so you are talking about those values, and you can see me taking those values and putting them here. What about D with G? There is no connection, so zeros. We continue now, we talk about E with E. Now E with E means E with itself. There are three elements, so you can see three places highlighted. E with G, there is only one element, so you can see this element being highlighted. And finally, G with G, once again, one of those elements that has, like G with G, is this one. And you can see one, two, three, four elements sharing this point. So you can see four elements being highlighted. What about the rest? Well, the rest is being basically filled by means of symmetry. So everything below the line is being filled by means of symmetry. How do you do that? Well, you basically start counting one, two, three, until the end. And one here equals one here. 2 here equals 2 here. So every step you move here to the right will be equal to every step you move down here until you reach, for example, the almost the penultimate one, which is negative 1.28, and the last one, which is 0.96. So yeah, that's actually really easy. Now, are we finished? No, we're not finished because we need to solve this equation. So how do we solve that? We need to invoke the boundary conditions. How do we invoke those? Well, what are the things you know? You know that at A, the movement in A in the X is zero, and A in the Y is zero. At D, you know the movement in Y is zero, so you can slash the first, the second, and I think three, four, five, six, seven, the eighth degree of freedom, you can slash them through because they are zero, and you will have to filter the values out that remain. So those values in the red box are being filtered here. The values of the F capital uh, vector. Because remember, we are saying F capital, the forces, equals K capital multiplied by the movement, D, in the global sense. So notice that F capital is being filled. At A and Y, there are forces, but I don't know them. And luckily for me, they're getting slashed. At B, I have zero in X, zero in Y, because there is no external force at B. There is an external force at C, and you can see in X being zero, and in Y being negative 1,200, because the external force goes down 1,200. In D, you don't see anything in X and D, and you see a reaction in Y, but it's being slashed. In E, you see 400 in the X, that's this one, and nothing in Y, and in G, you see zeros. So yeah, that's that. Now you have a system of equations, you can solve it. How do you solve it? Well, you simply say that U equals K inverse, 
left multiplied by f. This needs to be done. You can actually use the Gauss elimination or Chelosko decomposition. For me, I'm not interested in this because I just use MATLAB very quickly. If you use it, then you can get the answers immediately, as you can see here. U equals k power minus 1 uh, f, uh, and basically you can get the deflections, which are those things. And from the deflections, you can find the forces. How do you find the forces? Well, you need to say F capital equals the stiffness matrix K capital multiplied by U. K is not this. It's the original K, the OG one. is basically, basically this, this big block, the entire thing, before you slashed anything. And U is also the OG one, which is basically not this. This is not enough. If you take the original K and multiply it by this U, it will not work because this U is missing some stuff. What is this U missing? Well, it's missing UAX and UAY, and it's also missing here UDY, because those were the degrees of freedom you simply slashed. Remember what you did here? You slashed them away. So when you want to find F, you're going to use the original K and multiply it by the U matrix, which has 0, 0 in the beginning, then some values here, and then a 0 at dy, and then the rest of the values. So you need to be careful here. If you multiply them, you get those values, and from those values, you can find their actions. What does this mean? This means that the global force at x is negative 400, at A, so you have an action here of 400, which makes sense from statics, because 400 right means 400 left. You have, you have an action at A, which is 300 going up, which makes sense. And you have an action at D going up, which is, I think, 900, if I read this correctly. And well, if you do your static analysis, I think those are correct, so this checks out. Did we finish? Well, no. Like, why did we do all of this? Because maybe we have a design problem, and we want to know if the deflections are okay, and if the stresses are okay or the forces are okay. Now, if you want to find the stress, you need to find the force inside the element. And that's what we're going to do. Notice the deflection is really itsy bitsy tiny because my forces are really small. But I took this from Hibla's book, so I'm not going to basically complain a lot. Now, we want to find the local forces inside the elements. How do I do that? Well, you know that F local equals this local stiffness matrix multiplied by the local vector. So, for element AG, you need to find the local displacement vector of element AG. Now, you don't simply go, and that's a big issue here, as our dear subscriber Donald Khani has mentioned or in his comment on the previous video, you are going to be surprised. Like, if you think that AG's deflections are going to be 0, 0 for A, and this and this for G, so 0 0.0865, and negative 0.1570. If you thought that AG's local displacement are those values, this is unfortunately incorrect because those values are in the global axis direction, meaning that you cannot simply take those. You cannot simply take A00 and G this. You cannot take it because those are global. You need to get the local out of them and notice always that anything local equals transformation multiplied by global. If you have the global displacement, you multiply it by the transformation matrix to get the local displacements. Now, of course, I've showed to you here the transformation matrix used for that element. If you do this, then you can basically use the stiffness matrix, the local one, and multiply it by the local deflection to get the local forces, which are here. What does this mean? This means that for AG, if this is A and this is G, the point A moved nothing in local X and Y, and the point G moved negative in the local X, which means it moved back in the local X, 0 0.025, negative, and it moved down in the local Y axis, negative 0.1775, and of course, Nobody cares about the 1775. We care about this, of course, multiplied by 10 power minus 5. And it's exactly this thing that causes you forces. And how do we read those forces? We read them as compression 500. Why? Because here is your A and here is your G. And the force at A in X is positive 500, so it goes in the positive local axis sense. And the force at G is negative 500, so it goes in the negative local axis sense. And those forces create compression on the element, and that's why I have compression 500. 
This will be rinsed and repeated for each and every single element. And you can read this in the slides. I have done this for almost every single element. And there is even one of them that is zero, which is kind of cool. It's PG, and that's your element PG, and it turns out the forces inside PG are zero. That's correct, because PG is a zero force member according to statics. It's kind of cool to remember things back in the day. And you can see me doing this over and over and over again, and finalizing by showing a robot uh, analysis comparison between what you get in robot and what you got in the slides. Now, I want you to try this. I have done this in robot and I have analyzed my structure and I got identical results between what robot does and what you get. So it seems that you can replace your multi-thousand dollar, multi-k dollar software with a simple MATLAB code that you create yourself. Spoiler, it's not that easy. Trust me, I've been working on it since 2016 uh, and I'm in my third iteration. I'm almost ready to go commercial with it, but for now, uh, I am not, so I need to continue. So at least you can, well, have your own rot routines in the analysis uh, for yourself for trusses, and it becomes highly lucrative if you want to create your own uh, tailored analysis software. It's not a full-fledged generalistic software, a robot is a generalistic software. No, but maybe a specific analysis software where you only want to deal with trusses, you know, a small plugin or something in, in any of those softwares. So yeah, uh, you should try do this in Autodesk Robot and try get it. Uh, you should have all the capabilities of doing this in Autodesk Robot. And uh, I think that I will link a playlist for basics of Autodesk Robots here above. Check it out. That's everything I wanted to talk about in this video. I know I have not added anything new to your knowledge in this video if you have been following my videos in the finite element method series. But well, at least we have a bigger example that we can do ourselves and really take a look on what really is happening if you want to try the finite element method by hand. So I hope that you enjoyed the video. And of course, before I finish, I want to give a huge shout out to our dear channel members whose names are gonna be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for all their support to the channel. They, will, they allow us and enable us to produce those videos on time. So thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. With that being said, I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment, and subscribe, especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video.